Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of Trial Day 19 in the Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cups, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. So, Day 19's testimony started with Kevin O'Hara, a lieutenant with the Massachusetts State Police and a commander of the state's CERT, C E R T, team. That team conducts searches and rescues of people and evidence. At 2.30, the afternoon of January 29th, Lieutenant Tully from the Norfolk County State Police Unit called him, the witness, to see if CERT could assist with an evidence search. The witness alerted his team that they were being called on and to get ready to get, this, to, get to the scene once the assignment was approved. It was approved, and so he headed to 34 Fairview and arrived there just before 5 p.m. Now, across examination, the witness testified that he was not aware that the scene at that point had not been controlled prior to his arrival or that it had been left open for several hours before that. So he met up with his seven CERT team members who all arrived just before 6 p.m. He said there were other about five other people there. He knew two of them to be state police, but he didn't know the other men and assumed they were Canton law enforcement. On cross, he said that at that point, he wasn't aware that Canton police had been conflicted out of the investigation. So by the time everybody got there and they started the search, it was dark outside. He set up a command post from his cruiser to serve as a base for the operations. He said that Tully directed him to where the suspect vehicle had been located on the street and where John was found, despite Tully not having seen either himself. The witness wrote a final mission brief to summarize the events of that day. He was asked about the accuracy of that report of the report details and why he included in the report that the quote, off-duty officer was hit and dragged by a vehicle at approximately 12.30 a.m., close quote. The witness said Tully told him to look for a man sneaker and taillight pieces, and Tully only told him to search outside, not inside that residence at 34 Fairview. So since Tully had told him that a car was involved in the incident, the witness asked to see a picture of the car. So, you know, he'd have a frame of reference of what they were looking for. Tully told him that there was no picture because it was being towed to Canton PD and uh, it was currently being followed by Proctor and Buchnick, who are both state troopers. Proctor and Buchnick did not go to the scene at any point that this witness was there. So the witness described this search that his team did over a 50-foot area that they performed a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder grid search and used their tools, including the headlights from one of their vehicles, headlamps, shovels, small rakes, and a push broom, no leaf blowers. On cross, he said that best practices for searching through snow would be using small hand tools. They also used a GPS system to document the exact location of where evidence would be found. The search area, which was closer to the street and the curb, was different than the area that the Canton police officers had searched earlier. And this could explain why the Canton police officers didn't find any evidence other than, you know, the blood from the red solo cups that was put into the red solo cups and John and the glass. And what else did they find? I think that's all they found there. Um, anyway, the CERT, team, the CERT team was searching in a different spot, basically. So he said whenever they find anything of evidentiary value, they would stop searching until Detective Tully came over to document the thing with photos and put it into an evidence log. Once he had documented it properly, they continued their search. So what did they find? multiple pieces, about six or seven, of red and clear taillight. He said they were on the street in between the flagpole and the fire hydrant. They also found a sneaker in the same general location, upside down, flush up beside the curb. He said all this evidence was found at ground level, so underneath the snow. 
He described the depth of the snow as 18 inches. And the GPS uh, tool that they were using was used to document the location of the three largest pieces of taillight that were found at the scene. We saw photographs and evidence that showed one of the pieces of taillight as it was recovered after being shoveled. We also saw photos of a black Nike sneaker as it lay upside down, abutting the curb. It had been completely buried in the snow. Note that it wasn't buried by plowed snow because all the plowed snow was more to the middle of the street since the snow plow only went through the middle of the street. We saw a map showing the GPS points of the sneaker and the taillights. He pointed out the search area also in the GPS, which was along the street line from the front door of 34 Fairview heading south to the end of the property line, which is where they found the sneaker and the taillight pieces. On cross, he was asked at length about the placement of the distance between the pieces of evidence found, but the witness used to agree to specific measurements because he didn't personally measure them. But in prior testimony, he previously gave approximate distances. Additionally, he said that he only marked three pieces of the taillight on the GPS because any further pieces would have just shown as being right on top of each other on the map. So while at the scene, he said that the only person who came out of the residence was a guy who came out and asked if they were there for what happened earlier and then went back inside. Presumably, that would be Brian Albert, right? Interesting. The witness said that he told Tully that due to the bad conditions, the visibility, the dark, and the weather conditions, the team probably didn't do as thorough of a job as they would ordinarily do, and that it's possible they didn't find everything. He offered to have his team return to the scene during daylight hours to continue searching if Tully requested. On cross-examination, the witness said that Proctor, or uh, nobody, Tully, Proctor, Buchanan, nobody called him to return to the scene to conduct further searches. The next witness to testify was Maureen Hartnett, a forensic scientist for the State Police Crime Lab. She explained that in her job, proficiency tests are given for her position two times a year to ensure maintenance and competency in her analysis. Those tests are required by the accreditation body for the lab. She then explained how she failed one such proficiency test in 2022. The test was for hair and fiber identification. Basically, she got answers wrong, which required remediation that consisted of having a meeting with her supervisors to go over her wrong answers, why they were wrong, and how to correct her mistakes in the future. She took an additional test after studying more, which she then passed. During that remediation process, she was removed from some of her job duties, such as technical analysis. So she explained that she, in her job, performs blood tests by screening and confirming the presence of blood. In January 2022, she was asked to examine a black SUV that was in the Canton PD Sully port. She was with another state police lab employee who was taking photographs. After identifying the vehicle as Karen Reed's 2021 black LX570 SUV, she explained the damage that she observed to the right passenger side taillight. She saw a dent in the truck door, scratches on the bumper, and broken taillight. She also noted an apparent hair on the rear quarter panel and apparent pieces of glass on the rear bumper. She tested the hair back in her lab and left the apparent glass for the trace unit to identify. We're going to hear from the trace unit in later testimony. So we saw photos of the SUV. She said she did a visual examination and also an examination for stains or fluids that may have been left on it. She said she was told that the car may have been involved in a hit and run and was asked to look for biological material. She performed blood screening on several parts of the rear of the car, which all came back negative, no blood. She also collected the glass from the rear bumper, paint stains from the rear door and bumper, the hair, and a taillight housing, all for testing. She said the taillight damage wrapped around from the rear to the passenger side of the car. This is one of those 
big tail lights that you know starts in the back and sort of wraps around to the passenger side of the vehicle. She described her collection methods for the pieces of evidence using either bleach tweezers or disposable tweezers to avoid for cross-contamination. She said she removed the tail light and its housing, but she had difficulty removing it from the vehicle. So another police officer who happened to be there helped her remove it. He undid the wires while she held the tail light, but she didn't recall if he wore gloves. She did. Once it was fully out, she put it into a brown paper bag for transport back to the lab. She was also given a broken drinking glass that she was told was from the scene and several solo cups with, quote, frozen red-brown stains, close quote. She packaged the glass in a brown paper bag and she allowed the solo cups to thaw before taking swab samples from the cups. She left the solo cups with Canton PD and took the swabs with her back to the lab. Once in the lab, she examined the taillight and swabbed it for the presence of DNA. She was also given John's outer shirt, that long sleeve gray and black hooded shirt for testing. We saw pictures of the shirt and the cuts and holes that presumably correspond with the cuts and scrapes on John's right arm. She said she used an alternative light source around the holes in the shirt to see if there was any biological material present, but she didn't find any. She swabbed the areas around the hole because she was told there was possibly a canine uh, potentially involved. Her lab doesn't do that type of testing, animal testing. So she took the sample for the first time ever and she sent them to the UC Davis lab in California for veter veterinary testing. If you'll recall, we heard testimony from the scientists at UC Davis who tested those samples that this witness sent in. That witness found not canine, but pig DNA. The witness also conducted blood screening and confirmatory tests on multiple stains found on the shirt, his undershirt, his jeans, and both shoes. She also testified about John's fingernail clippings. Her testimony on direct just, honestly, it just droned on and on and on. I may have fallen asleep in the midst of it, to be perfectly honest with you. On cross, the witness clarified her notes that the one and only time she went to Canton PD, Sally Port, it was February 1st, and it was at the request of Trooper Proctor, who she learned was in charge of the investigation. She said that the photos and notes she made about the condition of the SUV had nothing to do with the possible motor vehicle pedestrian accident. She drew no conclusions of what caused the dent, the scratches, the broken taillight, no conclusions were drawn. So I think that's probably, possibly the most important portion of her testimony that she noted the damage to the vehicle but she didn't say that it was caused by, you know, hitting a human person. She didn't find any blood back there, remember? However, she did look for human biological materials, which she said she did not find. About the solo cups, she said she doesn't remember if they were individually labeled. She didn't label them herself. She said she took two swabs from only one of the six solo cups, because it was her understanding that all the cups contained blood from the same one blood stain at the scene. Now, what we know, because we watched the video, was that there were multiple separate stains in the area. So I don't know who told her there were only, there was only one stain. She testified that no DNA testing was done on the swabs. Why? Why? It's her job to take swabs of everything possibly related to an incident, but it's up to either a prosecutor or an investigator to ask for those samples to be tested. So at this point, we have no idea if there were multiple contributors because no DNA tests were done on those swabs. She was asked about the removal of the taillight from the SCB. And she said that she took one swab for the entire light. She took uh, pieces of glass from the car bumper, but she never counted the pieces of glass that were taken. 
She said they were not embedded on the bumper. They were just sitting on top of the bumper. This, despite knowing that the vehicle had been moved or driven a lot um, since the alleged hitting of a person. It had been driven from Canton to John's house in a blizzard, parked for several hours. It drove around Canton when the, the defendant was looking for John. It was driven to the defendant's parents' house about a half hour drive away. And then it was towed back to Canton. That's a lot of movement in really bad weather. This raises so many questions about how those pieces of glass were not in, that were not embedded into the bumper, the bumper, <laughs> how did they stay put for so long, driven around through the severe weather? How? She was asked about the apparent hair that she found on the quarter panel. It wasn't secured there anyway. It wasn't on a horizontal flat piece of, of material. It was on a vertical, basically a, a wall. It wasn't secured. It wasn't taped. It wasn't glued or stapled. It wasn't affixed in any way to the vehicle. She said she didn't know when the hair or the glass was deposited on the vehicle. And this statement is beneficial for the defense because it's their theory of the case that this evidence was planted basically onto the vehicle after the fact. So this hair could have been put onto the vehicle uh, once it was in the cell, in the Sully port. The glass could have been put onto the bumper of the vehicle once it was in the Canton Sully port. That's the defense's theory of the case. She was asked about her swabbing technique for the holes in John's outer shirt. Y'all, she used two swabs, two swabs held together in her hand and swabbed each of the nine holes. So all nine holes were swabbed with the same two swabs. She did the same thing with John's undershirt, which was an orange t-shirt. And then she combined those swabs used on both shirts into one sample. So there would be no way to indicate which shirt particular results came from. That just seems, it just seems sloppy to me. It doesn't seem like a very scientific way of doing things. She was asked at length about the timing and manner in which evidence came to her. She said John's shirts came to her in a brown paper bag from Trooper Proctor. So defense counsel asked whether the evidence was stored in the same place or bag in a way that, that the evidence might cross contaminate with each other. She didn't know how the evidence was kept prior to her receiving it. So she doesn't know, she can't testify whether there was any cross contamination of the evidence before it got into her hands. All she knows is she received evidence. That evidence came from Proctor. So we don't know where the shirts were being kept, how they were being kept, how they were being stored, if they were all just thrown into you know, a brown grocery bag. We have no idea. So that sort of chain of evidence, it raises questions. It raises questions. And questions are what the defense uh, relies on in establishing reasonable doubt. If you have questions um, about the evidence and about the integrity of the evidence, then that could raise a reasonable doubt in your mind as to the guilt of a defense or as to the veracity of the Commonwealth's allegations. The next witness was Ashley Vallier, another forensic scientist with the Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab. She was assigned to do a physical match from multiple items and received basically debris that was labeled as coming from jeans, boxers, sneakers, uh, John's gray shirt, and orange undershirt. She said she found pieces of plastic and lint and some other debris uh, 
in those packages. We saw multiple pictures of real evidence bags, finally, with those broken pieces of glass and plastic, um, a black straw. It looked like a black cocktail straw that you'd get uh, in a, getting a drink from a restaurant. All collected at different times on different dates, with many of them having been collected by Trooper Proctor. So my question is, how many times did he go to 34 Fairview after the incident? A good question for him once he takes a stand, if he takes a stand. I mean, as late as February 11th, so about 13 days after the incident, Trooper Proctor was finding large chunks, like large chunks of red plastic at the scene. So I just have so many, so many questions. So this is the witness that worked on putting all of Humpty Dumpty back together again. In other words, she was tasked with trying to put all these puzzle pieces back into place. I don't think she even finished introducing all of the evidence. Um, it was taking quite a long time. The Commonwealth was going through each and every individual piece of evidence. I think that there are better ways of introducing this to the jury. Um, but he's taking the long scenic drive instead of just getting to the point, which I think we'd all appreciate at this point. So that was the end of day 19. We'll continue back with this witness, Ashley Vallier, on Wednesday morning. So at the end of uh, trial day 19, the state crime lab witness who does the trace and physical match evidence is still on the stand entering in every single piece of glass and plastic. We're able to see the front of the evidence bags, which shows who was collecting the evidence on separate days, multiple days after the incident, which is strange. I mean, if you go there right now, are you still going to be finding pieces? The defense theory of the case is that these pieces were planted after the fact. Um, and it's just strange how, you know, everybody's finding more evidence for days and weeks after the actual incident. Also on day 19, we're still haven't heard from the chief investigator, which to me is sus. Why haven't we heard from him yet? Why have we not heard from the people who are collecting, finding and collecting the evidence from 34 Fairview over multiple trips for two weeks following the incident? We know that the lead investigator, Proctor, has many issues. We heard about them in the opening statements. However, to not have him testify by day 19 is exhausting and makes things confusing. Not that putting him on the stand will clarify things, but that's the goal, right? So that's where we stand as of right now. Make sure you check out my uh, community post that I put up yesterday. It has the court schedule for this week, and it also explains a little bit of my coverage of the case for the next couple of weeks and throughout the summer. I think we were told that this case was going to be eight weeks, and we are at the six-week point, I think. There are going to be many, many more witnesses, I believe, for the Commonwealth, and who knows what the defense will do in terms of witnesses. So we're still hanging in there. We are still trying to figure out why the Commonwealth has brought this case against Karen Reed. It just seems a little bit ridiculous at this point to be so far into a case and still have so many questions, still waiting on the pieces to be put together because through the 52 full witnesses that we've heard already. We're on our 53rd witness right now. And we still don't have an idea of how the Commonwealth alleges John was killed. I mean, frankly, we don't even have evidence on the record yet that he's dead. Why hasn't the coroner been put up yet? I don't know. That's all I have for you today. I will see you back later this week, uh, probably with a consolidated uh, recap of multiple days. I hope to see you then. Thanks for watching. Until the next drop. Peace.